Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching the disastrous Anglo-Zulu War by History Dose. Uh, I'm mainly reacting to this one because it is the new History Dose video. We reacted to their video on Henry Avery, and I've really enjoyed their work in the past, so I thought this would be a good one to watch. The topic is a little different than what we usually cover. Um, I don't know too much in-depth information about the Anglo-Zulu War. I obviously have a broad sort of education on uh, British colonialism in this time period. So I know a bit, but I've got a lot to learn, as I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. So I'm excited to get into this one. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. This video is brought to you by Incogni. Stick around until the end to find out how you can finally stop companies from collecting and selling your personal information. Mm, very nice. All right, history dose, let's go. Eighteen seventy nine, so we are truly reaching the heights of European colonialism over Africa. Now, the process of Europe imperializing Africa had been going on in one form or another for I mean you could say hundreds of years. There have been European trading posts and minor colonial projects, but uh, it'd been, you know, going on for a while basically. Um, but that, you know, project of imperialism had really kicked into high gear in the, I would say, sort of mid to late 19th century. This is when we really see, uh, you know, European imperialism at a fever pitch as they're snatching up, uh, you know, territory in Africa, which has been unclaimed by other European powers. They're all competing, uh, even though, of course, <laughs> that territory is claimed by a long list of different African tribes, peoples, states, etc. All these European countries are trying to snatch it up for their own benefit. Resonant chants are tempered by the approach of King Ketchwayo. 20,000 men are arrayed variously in ostrich feathers and jaguar pelts, and in their hands, shields and iron-tipped spears. And of course, um, I think the Zulu in particular are rather famous because of the resistance they put up against the Brits. In the end, um, you know, the British colonial project continued rather unimpeded, but... I think it was sort of this heroic stand they took, um, you know, to protect their homeland uh, against these foreign colonialists that really cemented uh, this conflict in history. Uh, and it's why we remember it a lot more than the dozens of other, uh, you know, colonial conquests that happened around this time period. The king addresses them. Mm. I have not gone over the seas to look for the white men, yet they have come into my country, and I would not be surprised if they took away our wives and cattle and crops and land. They want to take mm. me. What shall I do? Wow. Good the speech. The clans of the Zulu kingdom answer him with loud professions of loyalty, for they have not left their quiet homesteads to be showered here with the ashes of sacred herbs, blessed by the ancestral spirits for the sake of mere ceremony. Mm. This is a war camp. Red columns have crossed into Zululand. Some 5,000 British troops, as well as Africans in their service, march at the command of the second Baron Chelmsford. From the center column, Lord Chelmsford has repelled Zulu warriors along the border. He found hundreds of huts set around a pasture, the royal homestead of a high-ranking Zulu, and had it set on fire. Yeah, the, you know, of course there were many countries at this time claiming uh, land for themselves uh, and different imperial projects of varying degrees of brutality, but uh, obviously overall this whole era of imperialism was extremely brutal and uh, you don't have to look far to find countless atrocities, massacres, concentration camps, the burning of settlements, I mean just really really horrific stuff uh, everywhere you look, um, and some some worse than others, but some really, really bad, and generally pretty brutal. With the burning valley at their backs, the British now ride further into Zulu country. 
The stated reasons for this invasion are frivolous, even by the standards hmm. of the British Empire. Having brutally colonized... Yeah, and those standards were already pretty low. Uh, so saying that this was frivolous compared to those standards is really saying something, because, you know, the Brits really did not need much of a reason to go in and claim your territory. They could use, you know, any minor incident that they selected in order to go in, uh, you know, burn your cities to the ground and claim your land. Diamond rich lands claimed by Africans and Dutch speaking Boer settlers, the mm. colonial British now border the mighty Zulu kingdom. Virtually every able-bodied man within Zululand can be mobilized by the king for war, and each has been trained from boyhood in the art of combat. Of course, the Boers were sort of a, a unique group. I mean, this is Europeans, uh, Dutch, who came to Africa, settled down, and kind of set up their own community, separate from the other, uh, you know, European imperial projects, which would show up later. And of course, the Brits would... Uh, you know, fight wars against the Boers to claim control of that territory. So they are a sort of interesting and unique group. Though still, to my understanding, um, treated the local Africans very badly and brutally. The High Commissioner for Southern Africa, Sir Henry Bartle Frere, has cobbled together a series of isolated border incidents into a casus belli against mm. King Cetshwayo, despite the latter's vigorous insistence on avoiding war. Even as Frere's superiors excoriate him for apparent warmongering, this is a chance to strengthen regional British authority. Yeah, I mean, a lot of African leaders obviously understood that they could not withstand a war against these massive European powers. Um, many of them tried to avoid war, um, you know, to any degree. They would do anything they could. And, but in the end, you know, either their land would slowly be parceled away through manipulative agreements with European powers, or they would be brought to war whether they wanted to engage or not. So they really oftentimes had no choice, you know. They, they had to fight, and, you know, they knew that they would probably lose, but they really didn't have anything else they could do. To win glory and to demolish the largest block of indigenous power in Africa. Mm. Chelmsford has eagerly undertaken Sir Frere's quest, writing, The Zulus must be thoroughly crushed to make them believe in our superiority. I shall show them Jeez. how hopelessly inferior they are to us in fighting power. Jesus. I mean, this is a pretty typical uh, British or European perspective of the time. Um, you know, they look at their colonialism as justified um, because they believe in their own superiority, you know, the superiority of their race over other races. Uh, and these Europeans uh, believed, well, they believed many things, but... You know, a lot of them would either think that, you know, sort of survival of the fittest, this sort of Darwinian perspective, that they had a right to conquer those who they viewed as lesser, or, uh, and this was particularly common, say, in the French imperial mission, they believed that, well, they were bringing superior civilization to these Africans. You know, they were helping them. Um, just these really warped, racist perspectives that are really common at this time. The force Chelmsford is hunting, the great Zulu army now passes through undulating valleys and golden hills, lands once host to manifold clans. Mm. It was the great king Shaka in the early 19th mm. century who armed the fledgling Zulu people with iron-tipped spears and developed the horns of the bull battle tactic to encircle, defeat, and subjugate the warring clans. Yeah, I don't know too much about Shaka, but it is... Uh, I my understanding that he basically revolutionized uh, Zulu warfare and sort of tactics in that entire region and really changed how people fought and engaged in warfare. Uh, I think he was a really influential guy. Zulu tradition holds, the country was greatly disturbed by refugees, but some remained behind with their heads bowed low, finding it hard to abandon their homes. Mm. They who lacked courage fled. Shaka thus founded the Zulu Kingdom, a united network of powerful clans who pledge fealty to the Divine King, and several times per year send their men to fight on his behalf. 
Mm. Theirs is a land enchanted by the potent spirits of ancestors, whose favor must be curried by rituals, bravery, and discipline. Through the barehanded slaying of a bull, Quechua's warriors have summoned the powers of these ancestral shades, and their souls have been ritually purified, their minds fixed on war. The British camp stirs early in the morning of January 22nd. A few hundred Zulus have been spotted some miles off, perhaps the vanguard of the larger Zulu force. Mm. Neglecting to construct defensive works at the camp, Chelmsford gathers half of his troops and rides out to hunt them. But further north on the same morning, a small scouting mission finds a handful of Zulu warriors herding cattle. They give chase, clamber to the summit of a hill and stop, struck by the fateful sight spread miles across the valley. Oh man. And what a sight. I mean, if you were one of those uh, Brits there on that mission, um, I mean, I feel like regardless of how superior you felt to the Zulu, seeing that, you must have felt some fear in your heart. <laughs> I mean, that is an insane sight to see. 25,000 Zulu warriors come to defend their kingdom. The mm. valley shifts and roars, and the nearest clans charge after the British. Quechua's brilliant general, Nchingwayo, reigns in the warriors and strategizes with his officers. Chelmsford has left fewer than 2,000 troops at Isan Luana. There, uh -oh. the British camp watches the Zulu tide pour onto the plain, echoing with stirring war chants and the rattle of spears against shields. Thousands of Zulus, meanwhile, stealthily proceed to the flanks of the thin British firing lines. These are the horns of the bull, mm. the tactic honed since the days of King Shaka. Oh, yes. Yet the Zulu are using the strategy that is familiar to them. Of course, they're facing a force that is much better armed than they've ever faced before. Though, with the sheer number of people they have, I imagine um, they may be able to achieve uh, some level of success. Though, of course, their death rate will be much higher uh, than the Brits. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples throughout this conquest of Africa of you know, a very small number of European troops armed with rifles and, more importantly, Gatling guns, uh, being able to fend off uh, a much higher number of indigenous Africans who, um, you know, just don't have the same level of technology or organization. Um, but I guess we'll see what's going to happen here. I guess the Brits have been caught somewhat unprepared. British fire first stalls the advance, cutting down many. Once close enough, the Zulus hail spears and fire outdated guns into the British lines and then charge. Berserking mm. over heaps of fallen comrades, the relentless Zulus plunge their hand spears into British chests and... I mean, you do, uh, just to imagine, you know, being in the role of a Zulu warrior, you must have a lot of courage and bravery to charge straight forward into a line of British riflemen. You know, if you're in the front, you can be pretty damn sure that you're going to get shot. Um, you know, the first couple rows, they're really putting their life at a tremendous risk. So you've got to have immense courage and immense bravery to even attempt something like this. So that, you know, that's definitely something um, to be respected, though. It does show you that, you know, overall, the Zulu are in a really... Uh, untenable position, a really difficult position to be in, but, you know, these warriors are still giving it all they can. Stomachs. The British fall back to camp, scramble for ammunition, but Zulus charge the holes in their ranks and swarm the firing line from all sides. Wow. The sky dims under a solar eclipse. Wretched stragglers pull into makeshift squares and flail their bayonets. Zulus beat them with shields and drive spears through their torsos. Hmm. One officer, Charles Pope, raises a revolver and fires at a Zulu commander. The shot grazes his neck, another hits his leg. The Zulu throws his spear. Pope staggers into the grass, pulling at the skewer in his own chest. But the Zulu forces it back in and kills him. Jesus! I mean, yeah, this... Uh, here's the thing. If the Zulu can close in, uh, get into melee range, they've got it. You know, that's where they can defeat the Brits. Um, and of course, that melee combat... Um, which is what they're used to, is extremely brutal stuff. I mean, you're not standing uh, however many meters away from your opponent shooting at them. You're right up close, throwing spears, stabbing them back in. 
you know, really, you know, some pretty gnarly stuff we've got here. Some British flee toward a river as Zulus chase them on the rocky banks. All those captured or wounded are killed. The Zulus do not take prisoners. Jeez. After the final shots of resistance are spent, 1,300 of the invading forces lie dead. Wow. The victorious Zulus ritually remove their clothes and disembowel them so as to allow the souls of the dead officers, infantry, and drummer boys to escape through the stomach, lest the Zulus be haunted by a trapped spirit. Interesting. Night brings fog over the hills. Chelmsford makes his tepid return to Issa and Luana with his troops. Hmm. The shrewd offensive of the Zulus has exposed the imperious folly of Chelmsford and left yeah. the grass wet with the entrails of Englishmen. Yeah, I think this is, you know, famously one of those examples of where that British or European sense of superiority that I talked about has really got the Brits into trouble. You know, they weren't willing, or at least Chelmsford, he was in charge, wasn't willing to consider the possibility that maybe the Zulu were prepared, you know? Maybe they'd pulled one over on him. Uh, and so, you know, he basically walked himself into this situation. Uh, and so, you know... That, that, that sense of superiority and these racist notions that they have have gotten them in trouble this time. One captain recalled stumbling over the naked, gashed, and ghastly bodies of our late comrades. Mm. Although the stout resistance of a small band of British soldiers at Rourke's Drift and Isand Luana itself inflicted a great loss on the Zulus, their ranks remained mm. strong and furious. And here's the thing, you know, well, I'll speak for myself, I guess. You know, I wouldn't want to celebrate necessarily the individual deaths of really anybody, but any foot soldiers, you know, I wouldn't want to celebrate the individual deaths of these uh, British soldiers. You know, you can't necessarily blame each one of them for the Imperial Project, even though they were a part of it. Most of them, um, you know, probably... I had no idea they were going to be getting into this. Probably didn't want to be there in the first place. But overall, um, you know, it's sort of hard not to celebrate Zulu triumphs over the Brits because, um, you know, you just feel like they're, they're fighting back against this invasion of their homeland. They're the underdogs. They're the heroes of this story. And, of course, in the end, they're not going to uh, succeed overall. You know, the Brits keep going, keep conquering. But, you know, I, I find that... Uh, it's it's difficult not to really side with the Zulu, uh, even though, like I said, the individual murders, the individual deaths, is not a good thing. But this is warfare, you know. The, the Brits are invading, so this is how it goes. Zulus ambush a British caravan on the Entombe River and proceed to devastate a British force at Lobane. They track enemy forces to the camp at Kambula. In a show of defensive discipline, the British unleash a violent torrent of firepower on the charging Zulus. The death count is fewer than 30 British and up to 2,000 Zulus. Jesus, and this is more commonly what we'd see, you know, throughout Africa in this period. Forces of Europeans losing maybe a few dozen men um, and killing thousands and thousands of uh, Africans. Um, you know, due to the superior technology and tactics. And, and this is really why the European conquest of Africa was so successful. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that the Brits were caught, you know, uh, unawares by the Zulu, we do have to remember that this is a very professional, well-trained army. Um, they were scrambling in that first battle, but in general, you know, they're ready for whatever comes at, at them. And even small forces of British soldiers can resist a much larger force of Zulu. The war has heretofore been the result of insubordinate scheming on the part of Frere. But now gruesome war stories reach the British public and statesmen and properly mm. animate the broader British Empire to exact revenge. Yeah, and this is also another sort of common theme we see uh, in this era and throughout history. You know, we have these colonial officials or commanders, um, you know, throughout uh, Africa, throughout the world, who, you know, they go on these expeditions. They really push the line um, and they try and win military victories against indigenous peoples. 
and sometimes they're successful. But even if they're not, even if they come away with a loss, well, that loss gets reported back in Britain. The public gets riled up. You know, oh, how dare they kill our, our young boys, our young men. Uh, of course, there's also the racist sentiments we talked about. You know, the the British public is, you know, outraged that, um, you know, these Africans who they see as lesser would be able to win a victory or kill, um, you know, their quote-unquote superior um, British soldiers. And at that point, now everybody wants to go to war. And now this colonial official who may have been acting on his own now has the support of the public and then the government. And then everything just escalates. A second invasion is mobilized in late May, and now a foreign force of 25,000 roams Zululand. Jesus. King Ketchwayo continues, as always, to ask for peace, but the initial demands of Frere remain unchanged, most notably the dismantling of the Zulu military system and the admittance of British colonial officials into the kingdom, terms tantamount to the abdication of the Zulu throne. And this is what I'm saying, you know, um... This leader, he's been asking for peace this whole time. He's basically forced into warfare, and now he fights against the Brits. Some victories, some losses. He's lost a lot of people. And now the Brits sent 25,000 men to patrol his land. And now what, what choice does he have? I mean, he's screwed. You know. So this is really the sort of imperial experience. Um, it's just really, you know, no matter how... Um, these uh, indigenous, in this case, African leaders behave, they've really got no options. There's nothing they can do. They're just, they're, they're totally screwed. The disintegration of indigenous autonomy. Chelmsford thus rejects Cachuayo's attempts at ceasefire and diplomacy. Disgraced by the defeat at Isan Luana, mm. Lord Chelmsford learns that he will be replaced by a man called Sir Garnet Wolseley in a matter of weeks. He Damn. will have to restore his reputation before then. Oh, okay. And see, and this is where, you know, we were just talking about individual colonial officials who can, uh, you know, do a lot more than they should be able to do in their position. And now we see stuff like ego coming into it. You know, uh, Chelmsford, Chelmsford, Chelmsford's ego has been hurt by, uh, you know, he's been embarrassed by the Zulu. And, uh, of course, a man like this, uh, you are not talking about, um, you know, I'd say a very respectable individual. This is a little man, right? His ego feels hurt, and so he's willing to risk many lives to restore his ego and his reputation. And that's what he's going to do. And it's to the detriment of everybody, um, particularly the Zulu. But, you know, these are the kind of people we, we see in positions like this. Buying orders to stay in place, Chelmsford ravages the countryside, driving inhabitants and cattle from their modest homesteads. It yeah. had been cattle that provided the pastoralist Zulus with much of their food, furnished men with status and the means to pay dowries to acquire multiple wives. Women, meanwhile, fulfilled child-rearing duties and supplemented food supply with small-scale agriculture. Now emerging hazily ahead is the greatest herd in the most sprawling homestead of all, Ondini or Ilundi, the mm. capital of the Zulu kingdom and the house of Ketchwayo. Chelmsford rallies his 5,000 troops. Cavalry roam the edges of the battlefield and the infantry forms a large square. Over 10,000 Zulus emerge from the swaying grass for a final stand. The horns of the bull encircle the British and then rush inward, met this time with the thunder of cannons and the tearing of the Gatling gun and the ceaseless rifle fire. Mm. No Zulu comes within 30 yards. And it's sad, you know, the Zulu are doing what they can. You know, they're fighting the best they can, resisting the best they can, but like I've repeatedly said, there's just nothing they can do, not against this massive, now massive, since all these troops have been sent, and technologically superior force of Brits, um, you know, with their weaponry, their cannons, their Gatling guns. Um, I, I'm not sure what level of machinery they had at this point, but basically with the advanced weaponry, the Brits are just going to absolutely decimate them. The British shoot to death many of the wounded in retreating. Smokestacks and hissing flames overtake the valley as the royal capital falls. 
Tired chiefs surrender, and the British burn Zululand in their hunt for Quechuayo. They find him in the Ngombe forests, imprison him in Cape Town. He tells his captors, I was king of the Zulus, had my country invaded by the Queen's troops, tried to defend my country, but was beaten, taken captive, and brought down here by the Queen's orders. Here mm. I intend to remain until the Queen restores me to Zululand. The struggle for power is familiar to Quechuayo, for he first gained the throne by killing his rival brother and slaying the men, women, and children of that clan. Mm. But if the fallen Zulu kingdom made devastating war against rival clans and peoples, it had also gleamed as a strong and united bastion of African power in an age of colonialism. Yeah, and unfortunately, they're dealing with different enemies this time around. This is not a tribe versus another tribe. They're facing, uh, well, a whole European state. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no option to uh, fight back or get your revenge later because the Brits can basically do what they want at this point. After a visit to London, Quechuayo is released to Alundi in 1883 to find his kingdom partitioned by the British into contentious and warring districts. A rival mm. chief opposes his return, enlists the aid of Boer mercenaries, and attacks the new homestead of Quechuayo. The loyal general Inchingwayo is killed, and the bleeding king escapes again into the forest. Nearing his 60th year, the deposed king of the Zulus dies either by heart attack or poison. The British soon annex Zululand, and the old clans are violently pressed into the colonial hierarchy in later South Africa. The path Yikes. ahead is beset by persecution. It will be endured by millions of Zulus who speak still in the old tongue, sing and dance in the royal tradition, and tell stories of a great kingdom that, for a moment, triumphed against the British Empire. Mm. In all yeah, uh, and they're about to do their ads, so uh, go and check out their video, leave a like, check out their sponsor, show them uh, support for making these fantastic videos that we've been getting. So yeah, I mean, the story of the Zulu, um, you know, at the end of the day, it is a story of failure, I guess, you know, they, they couldn't resist the Brits, but also in a way, it's a story of triumph, you know, it's a story that would be remembered by people for generations. Um, a story of resistance. Um, you know, they had some victories over the Brits. It, it was a great triumph. And, you know, the treatment of the Zulu by the Brits is not, you know, like I said earlier, this is not uncommon, you know. Um, classic Brit strategy of uh, force your enemy into warfare, uh, even though the tribe has been trying to avoid it for a long time. You know, fight them, in the end completely demolish them, maybe burn their capital, steal their stuff. That's how uh, the Benin bronzes ended up in the British Museum. Um, you know, they were Brits were doing what they do, burning a capital city and stealing the artwork, uh, and then you can annex it for yourself. Yeah, pretty common uh, strategy. You can see all the steps laid out. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, it was a really interesting video. History Dose does a great job. Um, I love their presentation, their editing. Uh, they do a really, really fantastic job with this stuff. Uh, I like how they presented this one, and it's just... You know, one story in the wider story of European imperialism. Um, you know, like I said, overall, truly, truly brutal. Um, we can see that here, though. There was more brutal events, like, uh, you know, the Congo. That was one of, uh, you know, the worst examples we can point to. But overall, you know, uh, a definitely a fascinating period in history, um, but also a, a really tragic one, you know, one that's... It's pretty sad to look back on. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction. Uh, if you did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.